Hey guys, welcome to Adam's uh, podcast here. This is a, our third podcast. So, uh, hey Adam, how's it going? Hey, how's it going? Good. Good. All right, all right. So, uh, last time on the uh, second podcast, we talked about how people need to modify their training to fit their body types, to fit their, um, you know, their progression and so on, right? Yeah. So today I wanted to talk about another piece. Actually, you you posted this on Facebook as well, a nice long article about it. And the question that came out of it is, um, even though you modify your training to fit your your body type, yeah. and to fit you know what your your level, mm-hmm. people still don't take into account the the actual real feedback that they get when uh, when they're training. Yeah, they're stuck on you know like say if they were punching you know like a rear punch or a lead punch whatever they would they don't want to modify it based on what feedback they get from their partner. No, no. And uh, why is that? Like why why don't people uh, want to modify? Well, sometimes uh, I don't know they get attached to an idea. I think that's especially true in the internet age, like in the information age. They fall in love with uh, a concept they read about or maybe something that they were introduced to, and they don't want to let that concept go. Right, like. I think I talked about this before, and to give you a brief example, like one time we're working against a tackle, right? And uh, this guy that I was teaching, he was rather new, and uh, he really dig Wing Chun. He really liked Wing Chun. So he asked me what to do against a tackle, and I showed him two techniques, technique A, technique B. And technique A was designed to work, and technique B was set up to fail on purpose, right? The technique that worked, technique A, I called it uh, karate. And then uh, technique B, I told him that it was from Wing Chun. He tried them both, and obviously the first one worked, and he experienced success. The second one didn't work, and he was on his butt quite a bit. Despite the fact that the technique doesn't work, he still uh, wanted to keep going with it and refused to practice the one that works, right? After that experiment, I told him I actually set it up for him that both of those techniques, neither one of them were actually from Wing Chun. Right? So that was a brief example of how people can get attached to a brand, a label, yeah, like a style yeah. bias kind of thing, right? Right, and uh, and that's true for almost every style. Like uh, in most style, anyway, <clears throat> usually the fame of a style rests on the top percentage of people, right? And so, and then you want to become that guy. You want to become that good, whatever the role model is for that particular style. And once you have that in your head, that it's hard for some people to let go. So instead of accepting feedback of what works in the present moment. Um, Sometimes they refuse to accept that feedback, and it becomes very difficult. If they can let it go for a second, instead of trying to be like somebody else or some concept, if they can just listen to feedback, not my feedback, but their own feedback of what works, and listen to what works and follow that and modify accordingly, they're going to experience a lot more success and a way faster learning curve, right? So is it, uh, I always thought it was kind of a psychological thing where you do something long enough, you get good at it. Yeah. And it's hard to get away from that feeling that you're good on at it because once you get realistic feedback, now you thought you were good, but all of a sudden you look and you're not that good anymore. You know, like you're like when you learn something new. Yeah, right? when you learn something yeah. new, right? So, you know, it's um, people are resistant. To, to they change. are resistant to change. We, yeah. we all resist to change, not just in martial art, but in all areas in life. And a lot of times we can do things for better our health or our relationships or whatever. And even though we know the right thing to do, aside from a discipline issue, a lot of times people re, like resist the unknown. They resist change. And I think that's very normal because we're wired to protect ourselves. Right? All humans are. And so we're wired to resist change in many ways. But one of the most beautiful things about martial art is that it can teach us to allow change to happen. And until we let go trying to be like somebody else, that's never going to happen, right? So this whole podcast series is really to help a beginner when they first start to learn Kung Fu, right? Right. So this podcast is for a beginner. So when you're beginning a new pursuit, you must first identify the objective very clearly of what this pursuit is. In the case of a speed drill, the objective is speed. In the case of power, the objective is power. This seems like common sense, but not so much. Sometimes, like I said, people get more attached to be like a certain concept than they are direct feedback. But if you know the actual objective of an exercise, if it's power, then the objective is power. If it's a speed drill, the objective is speed, then you should listen to the feedback based on that objective. Are you actually moving faster in a speed drill? If the answer is yes, and you're experiencing an improvement, 
why would you resist that to try to be in a way that doesn't work for you just because it is a concept you're attached to? So you have to identify that what you think and what you imagine and what you're emotionally attached to might not be actually true. Likewise, if you go into the restaurant, like I used as a metaphor before, and you look at the menu and the picture looks great, the description looks great, but the menu is not the food. The food is the food, right? So direct feedback is really important. Until someone can learn to listen to present moment direct feedback in the here and now, they're always going to shoot themselves in the foot, no matter what they're trying to learn, rather it's uh, martial art or something else, right? Right. So that's a big thing before you can show someone how to move. Sometimes people plateau in their speed and power, and you can give them a tip that will make them faster and more powerful, but you can tell they're resisting the idea, right? This is especially true if someone has, like you said, achieved competence in another system, right? Right. So, yeah. Okay, and... Uh the other thing that I remember you wrote is about uh, the idea of making short goals with your training. Rather than say, I'm going to get good at, you know, let's say karate or Wing Chun, you want to say shorter goals yeah. uh, that, you know, that are built from the feedback you get, right? So if you say, oh, I'm a little slow, then have a short goal to get faster. Yeah. I'm a little, uh, you know, I'm not that powerful. So have, this you know, is really important. Like, like, in professional sport training, there's a lot of very specific short-term measurement, right? right? If you're not very specific with your training and your goal is not short-term, it's very hard to measure your learning curve and how fast it is. It's also very difficult to rotate your training and to have enough recovery time to improve. So aside from um, setting up objective, you really want to cut up your training so short-term goals, right? If you do that, just try it out for a year, you will see that you improve a lot more, right? Like a lot of guys are banging on pads quite a bit and that's good, but after you plateau, more repetition is not gonna help you. You have to introduce something new, right? Once you plateau, more of the same thing won't bring you a different result, right? But first you have to plateau and everyone plateaus. Once you get to that plateau, you have to find a new way to do things. That's what a good coach is for, to give you a new tip and stuff. But if you have, if you don't set short-term goals and you don't measure your process precisely in a very, very specific way, it's going to be very hard for you to know whether you're plateau or not. Sometimes you see people practice something, 10 years later they're practicing the same thing in the exact same way simply because they're attached to a certain concept. If they're doing that, it's going to be very hard for them to teach themselves to change and adapt, right? So that should be a very early psychological benefit that the coach should teach your student. He doesn't even have to say it. He just have to structure the training in such a way that forces the student to face change. And if you force a person to you know, face change, now he's forced to make a decision. And the decision is simplified to the point of, look, either you want to improve or you don't. If it's simplified to that point, now he's, he's forced to become functional, right? If he stays, right? But if you talk too much and you go, you introduce him to too many concepts, especially concepts he cannot actually do, just to impress him, just to sell him a technique. Now this guy's never gonna improve because you're kinda like leading him around just to make sales, right? Just to get more students, and that's not right. So instead of introducing him to a bunch of stuff he can't do anyways, why don't you just show him tips that he can apply right away and see if he can actually feel improvement and let that guide him. Concepts. Yeah, right, so you gotta, right, you gotta protect your student from your own influence. You should not seek admirers and fame and people to call your name and cheer you on. Like, forget about your own ego and make him teach himself, right? With you guiding him, right? You know? And the guy's, hey, am I punching right? Well, you go, okay, well, let me show you, like, another tip. Let him experiment with it. If you're holding the pad and it hurts your hand a lot more than the first punch, well, he answered his own question, right? So everything can be measured, right? That's why I like weight training as a good example, like... If you're lifting like 100 pounds and then the next month you can lift 150 pounds or whatever and you can actually measure the weight you're lifting more, well, you know you improve, right? There's no more guessing. You shouldn't do it before you've actually gained, gained some serious competence first, right? Yeah. You can't just start saying, oh, yeah, I need to change, you know, I need to change and change all the time. Yeah. You should always get good at this stuff first before you you start modifying it for yourself, right? And yeah, and that's a very organic, natural thing anyways. Like take punching, for example. Sometimes people show beginners really short punches, and that's kind of cool. 
But you look at the average guy, he's got a job, he's got a full-time job, he's got family responsibility, he's got full-time school. He doesn't have a lot of time in his hands, and maybe this guy can only train two, two nights a week, right? Yeah, yeah. You show this guy really short motion and punching, how much co power can he realistically get? With a lot of repetition, I'm sure he can get a lot of power. But most people, they don't have that much time to invest in training. Now, if you show the same guy an extreme big motion of hitting, probably in a very short time, he's going to generate a lot of power. When that time comes and he experienced actual hitting power, now you can progressively and slowly through the months make it shorter and shorter and shorter until it becomes a short movement. But now it is a practical short movement because it was progressive. He's not losing any power. Every time you shrink the movement, he retains the power he have gotten. So you start with power and you keep the power as you shorten the movement. That's very different and completely opposite than starting the guy out in short movement and then maybe after 10 years, he still can't hit her. That's not responsible coaching. That's being extremely attached to a style or a concept. Now you're attached. And usually when someone is emotionally attached to a concept that they cannot do, they justify it by saying, yeah, but this guy can do it. Yeah, but this guy's not you. The guy that have made up that punch three, four hundred years ago, how did you know? That guy probably trained, what, 50, 40 hours a week? Yeah. You're not him. So that's one of the ma main important lessons you can learn from a Mershaw, and that is always, always be yourself, right? Based on what you can do, right? So, And I said this before in the last podcast. Anyone interested in this can look up the word of um, the work of Jesse Glover. Rest in peace, right? Like he was phenomenal at, and he wrote a lot about this, right? And this is very important, right? Yeah. You start off with competence instead of always reaching for something you can't do, which really discourages people and is a common reason why people quit. Yeah. I think people can become really, really good in anything they choose to do if they just give themselves a fair chance, right? Instead of trying to be somebody else, right? right, right. But this can't be just philosophy. Proper coaching is important. Like I said today, um, clear objective, short-term specific goal, clear measurement of improvement, starting with competence and slowly aim higher. These things are really practical concepts you can use, right? Mere philosophy is not going to help. It's just going to make you feel good for a few minutes, but that's not what I'm interested in. Right, right. right. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thanks a lot, Adam. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see you next time, guys. And okay. uh, as you know, Adam's uh, got a website, pragmaticmartialarts.com. You can go there, and uh, there's a lot of training videos. Sign up, check a it lot. out. <laughs> yeah, we got, a, what is it, like almost 80, 90 videos now? It's yeah, about yeah. 80 videos, yeah. A lot of content for you guys. So, yeah, we'll see you next time.